Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us today at Drug Free Workplace PA. We support, educate, and empower workplaces and communities. We are a nonprofit organization grant funded by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. We've been established to create and implement drug free workplace programs for companies and educate community members. We provide tools, resources, on site, and online education. Our parent company is Godenzi Incorporated, and we are a division of Access EAP. Today, we will discuss the cost of substance use, five stages of addiction, risk factors, protective factors, and recovery can happen. In 2017, there were over 72,000 deaths by overdose. 30,000 were fentanyl related. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is 100 times more potent than heroin and morphine. This graphic shows how overdose deaths per 100,000 citizens increased over time from 1999 to 2015. If I showed a graphic of 2020, every area of the United States would be filled. This is a 2016-2017 image of a countywide Pennsylvania map. You can see the number of overdose deaths per 100,000 citizens. You'll notice there's a higher concentration of deaths in the southwest re western region of Pennsylvania. This is due in part to pharmaceutical companies targeting the adjacent states of Ohio and West Virginia. The companies promoted opioids to doctors as non-addictive and provided incentives or bribes for doctors to write opioid prescriptions. As you can see, the opioid epidemic has trickled into PA and we are still experiencing the crisis today. This 2017 map shows the number of pregnant women impacted by a substance use. One in 25 women hospitalized for a pregnancy related issue in Pennsylvania tested positive for an illegal drug or a drug used to treat addiction. These are the actual numbers of overdose deaths from 2015 to 2019. There has been a significant increase since 2015. The numbers in 2019 would be much higher if we did not have naloxone or Narcan readily available. Narcan is a nasal spray that when administered can reverse the effects of an overdose. Anyone can purchase Narcan directly from a pharmacist without a doctor's prescription. All major chains such as CVS, Walgreens, and Rite Aid stock Narcan, so it is convenient for you to obtain today. In 2017, Pennsylvania providers wrote 57.7 prescriptions for every 100 persons. Synthetic substances like fentanyl have been introduced. Fentanyl is a prescription drug that is also manufactured and used illegally. Lacing a substance with a synthetic substance like fentanyl is cheaper to produce and when combined with drugs like cocaine, marijuana, or ecstasy can generate large profits for the seller. Typically, the user is not aware of the synthetic substance and it puts them at a greater risk for an overdose. When someone stops using drugs for a period of time, he or she will have a lower tolerance to the effects of the substance. Tolerance occurs when you need a higher and or more frequent amount of the drug to get the desired effects. If someone has a lower tolerance and tries to use the same high dose of the substance as used previously, it puts the user at a greater risk for overdosing. Self-medication is a response to tough issues. Self-medication happens when a person misuses prescription drugs, turns to illegal drugs or alcohol in order to cope with situations they find stressful or difficult. Also, illegal substances can be bought and sold on the internet through the dark web. Social media sites like Instagram and Snapchat are also used to sell and buy drugs. Most of the substances bought online come from other countries. In 2018, Governor Wolf made a statewide disaster declaration that was aimed to enhance the state's response to the opioid epidemic, to increase the access to treatment, and to ultimately save lives. It created a command center at the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency to track the progress and enhance coordination of health and public safety agencies. 
The declaration clearly outlines 13 initial initiatives organized by three areas of focus, prevention, rescue, and treatment. As we look at the numbers in Pennsylvania, it is clear that substance use affects many citizens. We want to take a moment to address stigma that surrounds addiction. It is important to recognize how our words and our perception of addiction affects those with a substance use disorder. An estimated 20 million people in the United States have alcohol or other substance use disorders, yet only one in 10 receives needed treatment. The stigma around addiction can be a major barrier to people seeking treatment. It is important to remember that our language does matter when referring to people with this disease. Research has found that people with substance use disorders are viewed more negatively than people with other mental illness or other physical illnesses. The language we use about addiction can contribute to the stigma, which ultimately can lead to those who suffer not to seek the help they so desperately need. These are some guidelines when referring to an individual with substance use disorder. It is important to remember to use person first language that focuses on the person and not the disorder. We have to help our country see that addiction is not a character flaw or a moral failing. It is a disease of the brain. It is a medical disorder that affects the brain and changes behavior. In 1994, doctors Voltau and Shelbert ran PET scans of the brain that showed the effects of substance use on, a, on brain tissue, specifically the limbic system that is responsible for our survival instincts and the cortex, which is responsible for executive functioning skills like decision-making, critical thinking, and impulse control. With chronic use, substances can hijack the brain and actually weakens the brain tissue causing the substance user to compulsively seek the substance without regard to the consequences. There are five stages of addiction. The first stage encompasses experimentation with alcohol or drugs, but also includes a person taking medication that a physician prescribed for a specific issue. With the continued use of a substance in the second stage, it is clear that the person likes how the drug makes them feel. Hangovers are more noticeable, and frequent where the person does not bounce back as quickly. Because of the continued use, it takes the brain longer to chemically repair itself and return to normal balance. In the third stage, tolerance is one of the first warning signs of addiction. Tolerance means the brain and body have adjusted to the drug, taking a greater amount to feel the effects. For example, a person who has developed a tolerance to a prescription painkiller a doctor prescribed will notice the same dosage no longer alleviates their pain. In the fourth stage, dependence is where a substance user will become physically at ill without alcohol or drugs. Developing serious withdrawal symptoms. A person can experience flu-like symptoms, sweats, shakiness, nausea, diarrhea, and severe vomiting when going through withdrawal. With dependence on drugs or alcohol, individuals do not feel normal if they are not using. This stage is a sign that addiction has taken hold. And with the last stage, addiction, individuals find it impossible to stop using drugs or alcohol, even when they no longer enjoy it or when their behavior has caused serious life problems and consequences. The obsession is constant. Once someone is addicted, they're not using drugs to feel good. They are using to feel normal. Substance use disorder can happen to anyone. 40 million Americans ages 12 and older are more than one in seven people who are addicted to nicotine, alcohol, or other drugs. This is more than the number of Americans with heart conditions, diabetes, or cancer. Addiction is a disease that doesn't discriminate. And it's one that's taking an extraordinary toll on our communities across the country. It is important to have an understanding of the risks of developing a substance use disorder. This is an easy way to remember the risk factors of that addiction. A, age of first use. B, fake life changes. C, coexisting mental health and or behavioral health conditions. And D, DNA, genetics, or family history. A, the age of first use. The earlier an individual starts smoking, drinking, or using other drugs, 
the greater the likelihood of developing an addiction. People who began using addictive substances before age 15 are nearly seven times likelier to develop a substance use disorder than those who delay first use until age 21 or older. Every year that substance use is delayed during the period of adolescent brain development, the risk of addiction and substance use decreases. B, big life change. Big life changes can include trauma, such as divorce, changing jobs, a serious illness or injury, or adverse childhood experiences, like growing up in an environment with adults who use drugs, are involved in criminal activity, or suffering from abuse or neglect. But a big life change can also mean chronic work stress. Chronic work stress may increase the risk of addiction if not managed in healthy ways, and can be considered a big life stressor. 40% of workers report their job was or is very extremely stressful. 75% of workers believe that employees have more on-the-job stress than a generation ago. And 26% of workers said they were often or very often burned out of stress by their work. C, co-occurring disorders. Many individuals who develop substance use disorders are also diagnosed with mental health disorders and vice versa. Up to 50% of mental health professionals report their clients also have a substance use disorder. 50 to 75% of clients receiving treatment for a substance use disorder also have a mental health disorder. And up to 75% of adolescents with a substance use disorder have also been diagnosed with a mental health or behavioral health disorder. Genetics play a key role in addiction. Genetic factors can account for up to 75% of an individual's vulnerability to addiction. If someone has a family history of addiction, he or she is, great, is at a greater risk of developing a substance use disorder in their lifetime. As we learn about some of the risk factors, it is important to remember that not everyone will develop a substance use disorder. Protective factors such as social connectedness, being part of a community of faith or other social community, support of family and friends, contributing to the community through volunteering or having meaningful employment, developing healthy coping skills through self-care like exercising, eating healthy, and getting enough sleep. These are just some of the vital protective factors in the prevention of addiction. Recovery can happen. Recovery from a substance use disorder is a process of change which individuals find a pathway to improve their overall health and well being. They live a self directed life instead of a life directed by their addiction. And people in recovery seek to daily strive to achieve their full potential. There are four major components in recovery health, making informed choices that support physical, and emotional wellness is important to those on the pathway of recovery. Having a safe and stable place to live allows the individual to focus on that pathway of recovery. Having purpose like engaging in meaningful daily activities as volunteering or meaningful employment is key for someone in recovery success. And also community, building relationships and healthy social networks. Recovery happens in community. It does not happen in isolation. If you or if you know someone in need of treatment for a substance use disorder, please call the Pennsylvania Get Help Now number. Thank you for joining us today and we will see you in the next presentation.